In Scotland, William Wallace is a national hero, a Scottish knight that fought for Scottish independence and died for it. But, as is the case with most national heroes, the life and deeds of William Wallace have been greatly exaggerated. Not to mention the fact that these accounts were far from being objective and depended greatly on whose side the narrator was. The real William Wallace was a bit different from the legendary hero. Hello, and welcome to 7 Facts. If you don't know who this guy was, think Braveheart, that's who we're talking about. Today, he's considered to be the father of Scottish nationalism. He's celebrated as a medieval Che Guevara that fought against the tyranny of the English. There are more than 80 locations in Scotland that claim to have some sort of a connection with him. The memorial plague that marks his site of his brutal execution is still adorned with fresh flowers to this day. But who was he? Who was this man who more than 700 years later still inspires such devotion? William Wallace was born in 1270 in the village of Eldersley, although these are only the assumed date and location. He was a member of the lesser nobility and not much is known about his family's history. What we do know is that Wallace was one of the main leaders of the First War of Scottish Independence. It was a time when King Edward I of England, the Hammer of the Scots, tried to gain more powers over this nation. After he defeated an English army at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in September 1297, Wallace was appointed Guardian of Scotland, the Regent of the Land, in the absence of King John Balliol, who was arrested in London. This was the culmination of his political and military career, but it didn't last for long. Just ten months later, his army was crushed at the Battle of Falkirk. After this, he disappeared from the public. Most likely, he went to the court of mainland Europe to seek assistance, especially in France. Seven years later, he returned to Scotland and was captured by his own countrymen and turned over to the English. By this point, he was no longer an important political figure. Nevertheless, he was tried and executed for high treason. The punishment for this crime was hanging, drawing and quartering. What is that? First, you're drawn or dragged to the place of execution by a horse. Then you are hanged, but only almost to the point of death. Then you're emasculated, which means that your penis and testicles are cut off. After that, you're disemboweled, beheaded and your body chopped into four pieces or quartered. Pretty, isn't it? These are some of the basic facts around which the legend of William Wallace was born. His deeds were exaggerated both by his supporters and his enemies. The main source of Wallace's legendary deeds is the 15th century epic poem The Wallace, written by Blind Harry 172 years after the man's death. The poem is obviously not a historical document and contains many errors and imaginary events. He is described as being a very tall person, 2.1 meters tall to be exact, handsome, strong and beautiful. In one story, he escaped the English by dressing up as a woman. In another, his wife is captured by the English and executed. In reality, neither of these events actually happened and in fact, as far as we know, he never married. The poem is a romantic description of a hero, not a historical document. Nevertheless, it contributed immensely to the myth of Braveheart. Before we continue, I'd like to ask you something. This channel has no sponsors, so if you enjoy the content I make, please consider supporting these videos by becoming a patron. You can check out my Patreon page by clicking here or find the link in the description. Ok, now let's move on to the next fact. Scottish historians for a long time used Blind Harry's poem as a baseline for Wallace's life, mostly because it's the only written record of the guy before 1296. It's been said that the poem is based on a manuscript written by John Blair, a friend of William. But that manuscript, if it ever existed, was lost a long time ago. 
Even if indeed there was a second source, the poem could have still been easily labeled as an idealized, charming work of art and not a historical document. The first contemporary document that mentions Wallace is the Chronicle of Lanacost. But that is a pro-English chronicle in which he is of course described as a bloody chieftain of Scottish bandits that rebelled against the king. This is again a subjective description, far from the truth. He was no thief or bandit, he wasn't oppressed and didn't fight for the oppressed. He was after all a nobleman, albeit a small one. If peace would have been kept, Wallace would have most likely remained a small nobleman in the Scottish countryside. But he didn't, instead he decided to fight for the reinstatement of King John Balliol, who was forced to abdicate by Edward I of England. The goal in itself was a bit weird for someone who fought for Scottish independence. John Balliol was put on the throne by King Edward I. In 1290, there was a deep political crisis in Scotland and the country was on the verge of civil war. Edward was invited to arbitrate the choosing of the new rightful king by law. He did, but not before every one of the contenders recognized him as Lord Paramount of Scotland. John Balliol was nothing more than a puppet king of the English. He was even summoned by Edward to stand before the English court as a common plaintiff. There was a short rebellion against Edward, but John was defeated, humiliated and imprisoned in the Tower of London. This was the man William Wallace was fighting for, although it's probably more accurate to say that Wallace was fighting for a principle. Having their own king meant that a degree of independence was still being kept, and humiliating the Scottish king also meant the humiliation of the entire kingdom. Wallace managed to instigate a revolt against the English and even became the regent of Scotland. In the movie Braveheart, William Wallace is shown dressed in a plaid kilt. Kilts are traditionally viewed as the national costume of the Scottish and the plaid signify an allegiance to a clan, except that they are a modern invention. The kilt was created by Thomas Rawlinson, an English industrialist from the 18th century who created them as a more comfortable clothing for his workers. Granted, this modern kilt was based on an older version, the great kilt or the belted plate, but even this comes from the English highlands of the 16th century. The modern kilt was never intended to be a national costume, nevertheless it did end up being adopted by local nationalists. The plaids were a fashion item imported from Flanders and had nothing to do with clans. That part was the invention of two Welsh brothers, John and Charles Allen. They published a book based on a manuscript called Vestiarium Scoticum, or the Garderobe of Scotland, a depiction of clan tartans that said to have been written by a knight in 1571 or possibly even earlier. It was a forgery, but their book had already become famous and widespread, so the idea of plaids and clans was born. But in the time of William Wallace, they were completely absent. But anyway, back to Wallace. Before he became a national rebel, Wallace conducted local raids and riots against the English, which probably came in handy experience-wise but we actually don't really know how brilliant of a military commander he was. When he defeated the English army at Stirling Bridge, he wasn't alone. Andrew Moray, a more experienced commander who conducted the rebellion in the Highlands, joined Wallace's forces and we don't actually know who commanded this battle. But we do know that, contrary to popular belief, Wallace was not a guerrilla fighter, nor did he like the style of fighting. It's entirely possible that Moray was the tactical leader of this victory. When Wallace tried a similar tactic at Falkirk, he was utterly defeated and lost his regency. In fact, he never won another battle after Stirling, nor did he liberate any castles or domains. But all of this doesn't really matter. Regardless of what he did or didn't do, Wallace was more than a leader. Even in his days, he represented an idea the idea of Scottish autonomy, history and culture. 
This is why he was dangerous for Edward, and why he was never pardoned or imprisoned, but executed in a horrifyingly brutal way. This means that Blind Harry's poem was not just a romantic poem. It was intended to uplift spirits and reignite a national consciousness. William Wallace might not have been the mythical hero we think he was, but he was a hero of the Scottish nation. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time. Bye.